You're listening to the Limitless Business Podcast with Scott Olford and Kay Putnam. Today, I am super excited to have Kim Ann Curtin as our guest. And we are starting the brand new Limitless Business Podcast format today, which focuses on, of course, storytelling. And Kim is a professional keynote speaker, executive coach, and founder of the Wall Street uh, Coach. She helps C- C-Suite. C-suite, C-level executives accelerate their personal and professional success through the development of a supple mind, a top of foundation of integrity. All I have to say outside of that entire bio, Kim, thank you for taking the time. All I do know is that uh, from the first time that I said hi via Clarity uh, to, of course, you connected me to the four people in amazing uh, Oahu while I was there. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm super excited to be talking about some really cool things today. Thanks for having me, Scott. I'm really glad to be here. Awesome. Cool. So as you also may realize if you're on the podcast or uh, watching this via YouTube, this is also our first video conversation. Totally don't know how this is going to go. But in saying that, in saying that, if I screw up, I can't just like go back. Um, So it's going to be interesting to just take one take and uh, Steve, our audio guy, is probably going to like us for that. So doing it live, (laughs) doing it live. Exactly. Um, so Kim, yes. And you know, we want to get kind of started with storytelling. We want to get it started with, um, you know, the real struggles, real, real challenges just before we started this, when we're just, you know, chatting uh, at the beginning, you were talking about, you know, all the, I guess, challenges that you've had kind of leading up to the release of your new book that's coming out in March. Uh, And, you know, while the public sees, oh, wow, published author and everything else, there's definitely been some very big challenges with, you know, going along that path. So perhaps we can start the conversation there and and see where it goes. Sure. That sounds really great. And I love talking about this story because I think it puts into perspective what really does take place. I think a lot of uh, the general public look at entrepreneurs and they say, oh, you know, I could never do that because it just looks like they have, you know, all the success and it's all the sexy things you see, you know, when you you look at all the people out there in the world. But I think to see the behind the scenes helps us, encourages us and makes us realize that, you know, it isn't for those people out there. It's really for all of us. Uh, So the story I, I would like to share today is how I became the Wall Street coach. And it really came down to uh, my needing to create business for myself. So I was really willing to go out on a limb. Uh, I had a really good friend hear me crying about how it, the summer of 08, I had been in business a year and a half, uh, walked away from a very lucrative salary, work, having worked in finance. And uh, I was putting groceries on my credit cards and I was really scared. I didn't know how I was going to su- sustain myself. Um, and because this has been since I discovered coaching what I call my bliss, something Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, speaks to finding in your life, I knew that I had to do this. Like, I couldn't not do it. But I also knew I also had to buy groceries. So I was reconciling, like, what am I going to do? And a friend said to me one day as I was lamenting my dilemma, uh, what if you did it for free? What if you gave it away? And so my first, uh, you know, walk, if you will, was to sit outside the New York Stock Exchange on the corner of Broad Street and Wall Street on a bench with a homemade sign that said, the coach is in. I I took a lesson from Lucy and the Peanuts where she used to have that sign, the doctor is in, and she'd sit at the little, you know, stand and give out advice. And that's what I did. And so I sat there with a really fancy suit on, by the way, because I knew my little sign might make people think, okay, she's crazy, which, you know, maybe I was a little, am a little. But anyway, there I sat in my fancy suit, my little sign, and it just so happened to be October 7th, 2008, and that was the day the market dropped over 500 points. And it also was the day that that day was so tense that probably people would have been talking to a lamppost. They were so strung out. It was a traumatizing day. And there I was, you know, just sitting there ready to really give coaching and advice and support. And... That day, you know, it was so hard to do that. I was so afraid of looking like a fool, 
uh, especially considering I had worked in the finance world and had made such an excellent salary. And now, like, what kind of loser am I that I have to sit on a freaking bench and give it away for free? But I just knew that I had to do this work and I was born to do it. And I couldn't keep it to myself. And I had to show with the world, even if that just meant giving it away. And so that story, you know, it also created my brand. You know, the media noticed me down there and eventually they began to call me the Wall Street coach. I never called myself that, but, you know, I'm a smart entrepreneur and I was like, hey, that is a heck of a domain name. That is a heck of a brand. And that is my people. Like, I understand Wall Streeters because of having worked in that industry. Uh, I knew I knew really instantly, wow, that's the niche that I had yet to find on my own that uh, that journey got me to. I can't imagine the gumption and just the pure gutsiness that it would take to sit down on that bench and and humble yourself that much just to share your gift with people for free, knowing what people's perceptions probably were going to be. I, I'd be so I'd be so scared shitless. Like I mean, yeah. you know, I've done some scary shit in my time. I, I I've yet to you know, I, and I really hope I don't ever have to. But I mean, like that is amazing. That is that's extraordinary. Um, sorry, yeah. Kate. No, that's back on track. It's it's, <laughs> it's like so awe inspiring and so just inspiring in general. So I, I absolutely love that story. And before we started recording. You said that not only was this a really low point, um, but you also made an important realization about the the power of being bold. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think what I really got for myself after that experience was that the boldness of when you know what you're here to do and or feel really passionate about something, you have to be bold because you aren't going to really... um, be able to get the traction you need to make. You need traction, right? It's it's a it's a there's a lot of information coming out at people all the time. You have to kind of be bold because people kind of yawn if they see the same old same old stuff all the time. So what that taught me. Uh, oh, and the other thing, in addition to bold, that I really want to speak to is authenticity. You know, you can't just be bold for bold sake. You have to have that backing with authenticity. I truly know I'm born to do this. I truly know that I'm all in, no matter what, to, to be a coach. Um, that's my authenticity, and that comes behind, that informs my boldness. So I think that's an important quality we miss. If people think, oh, I just have to be bodacious and outrageous. No, you have to have real authenticity behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just when you, know, you go back to, let's say, personal branding, uh, which is, of course, the big, big, you know, craze. And when people don't create their personal brand as their own values, and they're going around being people that they're not actually are to impress people that they don't really care about, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. And when you were going through this entire thing, I mean, you know, there's nothing more in my mind authentic than sitting on a bench with a sign saying, "Hey, listen, I can help." Uh, and I, I mean, just so that I know, you didn't have, did you not have experience at this time or just you just didn't have the ability? What, what, what was the reasoning behind that? I, I think it was because of the economy. I had already received uh, my certification at that time. I was already a year and a half into being a coach. I had started out the year and a half previously uh, moderately successful. I, I was, I had... Uh, eight paying clients before I even went to my first official certification training for being a coach. I was so, you know, sure that I was born to do this uh, and I was already working with a coach that I, you know, just went and called everybody in my Rolodex and enrolled them in be working with me. I said, look, I'm not certified yet. I'll give you a discount. That was, you know, at the very beginning when I first started. Uh, But I already had done that for a year and a half. I'd already had paying clients. But the summer of 08, I just saw my business taking a nosedive. And it was, of course, the incoming, you know, implosion. Uh, But people had already stopped spending money on things they considered to be a luxury. I'm sorry to say coaching even now is still viewed as a luxury, not a necessity. And I think that contributed to why, you know, the business just was coming to a standstill. 
you know, and, and I think my momentum too, you know, when you're first starting out, they say you need three to five years to really get the traction. Uh, I was not prepared uh, for a three to five year run. I, I wasn't financially prepared for that, and, and, I, and I wish I had been, you know. Does it mean I would have done anything different? Probably not, you know, but I don't think it was financially the wisest choice of mine. You know, I really didn't know that it would take as long as it takes. As well, it well, one thing is entrepreneurs typically don't even care, right? <laughs> like, you should have three years of finances saved up. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, entrepreneurs are like, hmm, that looks like a good way to go. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I, I want to just uh, I want to I want to go back for a second to something that you said there was well I completely forgot what I I yeah I completely forgot what I was going to say the there was a tra- there was a traction bit and then I have and then I have the whole self worth issues but I want to tackle that in a minute authenticity <laughs> yes yeah yes okay so. When you were, of course, of course, you were on this bench. You were obviously probably one of the most authentic times of your entire life. When a client came to you, did that like? How did you deal with, you know, being on a bench one day and then giving them coaching the next? Well, it didn't happen like that. You know, the people that came up to me on that bench really received my coaching in the moment. I did about fifteen to twenty minute sessions on the spot, and they. As far as I know, anyway, n- none of the people that I coached down there on that street corner ever became clients. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, so I don't think they, the people that I were, was, you know, helping on in those moments, in those conversations, uh, I don't think they probably were my, uh, they, I, if they ever came to me, they never told me that that's where they met me. Um, but I think what it did for me is it defined the niche. Right. Uh, and it, and it also showed me the immense need that was out there. Well, you and saw you kind of self-validated by just like going and doing something nobody would ever do, um, which how in I was like, yeah. well, I must really be serious. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, how much? How, yourself. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, you can't get it any more serious. Like, here's everything. Yeah, yeah, it blows my mind. I love it. I love it. It's a amazing story. Here, by the way, I didn't do it one day. I did it for one That's year. Right. When, That's right. That's right. What? Wow. I went, I went out almost every week. You know, if it rained or snowed, I didn't. But it was cold and it was hot, and I sat on the bench at lunch hour almost weekly for one year. Okay. Okay. So, so let me let me let me figure this out for a second. So you're there on the bench every single day, or like once a week. And I mean, by the year was up, I mean, you must have been, you must have had clients by this point. Like you must, like, were you, like at the end of it, were you doing it because like, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a starving coach. Um, or, or was it just because you just felt so much either passion or like, you know, I personally, I love just talking to five people a week. This is something in 2015 I'm doing five people a week for 20 minutes. They don't need to pay a dollar and they can get as much advice that as they want. Put me was, on the list. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 was it was it that type of thing, or was it was it something more? Um, it was it, it, once I once I, of course that first day told me that we were in the middle of a crisis, and the crisis continued. So I knew that the need was there, and uh, it was a combination of a good conversation I had with another colleague of mine who said, "Whatever you do, you know, be consistent about it." Be m- m- make what what do you, how long are you going to do this for? Are you going to do it for a week, a month, a year? Like figure that out. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it for a year because you knew that this thing with Wall Street was just beginning. Yeah. And it, you know, days after days, weeks after weeks, we kept hearing that, and it was getting worse and worse. And I thought, okay, I know it's needed there. So it was my way of kind of you know con- being a contribution back. And uh, and I started to take temp work. To pay my bills, so I wasn't. It wasn't driving clients to me immediately, at all. I was taking temp work, and in fact, was working as a temp at a global, you know, massive private equity firm. Uh, I was an executive and personal assistant prior to becoming coach. I did that for ten years at the C-suite level. I was the CEO's, you know, executive and personal assistant, and that's what I started to do. When you when you do that uh, in, especially in New York City. You, you know, there's very few people who fly at that level. And so when those 
go they go on vacation there's very few people who can kind of step into that role it's it's extraordinarily uh tense the roles there's you are never allowed to make a mistake there's a lot of balls in the air it's it's a hell of a it's a hell of a ride so in that position i started to take temp work as the ceo's executive assistant would go on vacation and so i was at this private equity firm doing that doing the free coaching down on wall street uh making not nearly what i would have made as a coach but giving me some money and that became my first corporate client. I was already working with lots of clients for that, but they said, well, wait a minute, what's this day job you have on the side? I said, executive coaching. We thought about bringing coaching in and they were my first corporate client. That's fantastic. Wow. That's actually a great transition for my next question. I was going to ask you to reflect on, obviously not without or without names or identifying information, but some of your coaching clients, I'd love to hear what some of the resistance and the challenges that they feel when it comes to making their own bold or authentic moves? You know, I think these are the things that everybody struggles with and the things that, you know, no doubt I see show up when clients come to coaching is that people uh, have the inner critic and they haven't yet learned how to reconcile that inner critic with their day-to-day functioning. Uh, and, and the inner critic can, you know, be a bus full of inner critics. Sometimes it's one or 50, you know, there's, but they're in there. And I think one of the things that is the hardest part of living fully engaged with life is how do you counteract what that inner voice says to you? We, we have our own intuitive voice. We have our own, you know, kind of like Kim's voice, if you will, that, that, that leads us with wisdom and whatnot. But the voice that usually says would, should, or could, should have done that, you know, what was wrong with you, what the hell are you thinking, that's the inner critic, you know, and those red flags or would, should, and could, you know you've got him or her speaking to you. Um, it, yeah. it, it's amazing to see um, how, how much that translates to literally everything in business. So um, one of the, um, our Limitless Business Mastermind group, I asked a question the other day of, you know, what do you need to let go of? To, to get to your accomplishments or dreams or you know goals or whatever it would be in 2015. And what one of the very interesting things was is that although you could look at all the different answers and they were all very unique and of course you can see where different people are in their life, um, self-doubt and that limiting kind of form factor of the fear of you know the, someone won't like them or you know they're going to fail their families or they're going to fail their you know their whoever it may be in their life. And that limits them of, you know, they say, okay, you know what, I'm going to do $250,000 a year in revenue because I don't think I can do half a million dollars because I'm going to have to take a little bit of a risk. Uh, Or that that self-doubting of the fact that, you know what, I've done $250,000 for the last five years. Why would I be able to do $500,000 now? Right? I mean, and, and it's the same thing, like, you know, when it comes to even like speaker fees or comes to coaching fees and all these different types of things. I mean, people undervalue themselves so so much i always i always kind of um i always kind of compare it that if you're a thousand dollars an hour and i spend an hour with you i can probably if if i was in the you know if i was your type of client and i spent a thousand dollars with you for an hour more likely than not i'm going to get at least a 10x return on that time so a thousand dollars an hour is really not that big of an investment right but Um, that critic and that inner doubt I think what people need to realize is that it's across the board. Yeah. People think, oh, well, when I get my MBA or when I get the vice president title or when I get the corner office or I get the sale book. It, it, it's, it's, like, it's like people that think that once they get that promotion, they're going to be happy. I mean, like it, it's the same thing of, of feeling successful. Once you get to that next goal, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was like the other day. Like I literally ripped off every single goal that I had last year and I completely crushed it. And I was like, man, I really set those goals too, lo- too low. And as I was putting my new uh, 90 days on my desk of what I'm going to accomplish, I was looking through and I'm like, ah, I could have probably made that one a little bit higher. And it's just like it's a constant battle of just simply it's just a daily process. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, I'm sure that Elon Musk built the gates, Steve Jobs when he was alive, but all those people had the exact same things that they were struggling with. And I think that's the illusion that when we look at those who are successful around us, yeah. we think that 
get to a level, whatever that level is, that that self-doubt will disappear or that that, uh, you know, sense of uh, and could I be doing it better is going to suddenly uh, not be not be around. And I want people to realize that it's there, even at really, really high level, high levels. And, you know, and, and I think for myself, I just look at my own journey. Uh, you know, I still have my own self-doubt, you know, like on, on a certain level, there's there's a confidence that I have now that I didn't have when I first started out. But there's still I still have those moments of like, wow, like, who do I think I am? You know, I'm not an economist. And look at this book that I'm writing about transforming Wall Street. Who the hell do I think I am? You know? so, so, so you must you must be really, really, really kind of you must have gone through or going through that kind of whole self doubt or like putting that book out there and like economists being like, this is, you know, crap, you know, tearing you apart. Uh, it won't, you know, it won't sell, you know, all these different types of things. Yeah, how the, how's that been? It, it's, you know, a daily process of trying to have the courage to move into the fact that, you know, I think, uh, I, I had a conversation with a stranger in a little restaurant the other night, and he, he was so interesting. He said he he was a recovering libertarian, uh, a now Keynesian, and and he you know he's asking me all these books. Did you read this? Did you read this? Did you? I was said you know no no no, and he's like. How are you going to defend capitalism if you haven't read the Communist Manifesto? I was like, I'll go read it. You know, so I went to New York Library the other day, getting all these books, thinking, Oh my God, I have to read this. I have to read this. And then I started laughing at myself. I'm like, I I never read these books, and yet I did read what I did read, mm -hmm. and and I saw something, and that's enough to say, Hey, I think we need to take a second look here, people. And and but that I saw myself getting caught in the very trap that you know I see my clients get caught in, like. Oh my God, I'm not prepared. And what if what if I get a, this question on Fox News or CNN? If I was so lucky, like even if I blow the question on Fox News or CNN, at least I'm on Fox News. Exactly. <laughs> I was just exactly. I was just listening to a podcast with Tara Moore. She's the author of a book called Playing Big, and she was talking about it. So Is I that go ahead. Oh, I think we lost. What was that, Kim? No. I hear you guys again. Okay. All right. I, yeah, I so I was saying, it. I was saying that I was just listening to a podcast with Tara Moore, who's the author of a book called Playing Big, and she was talking about that phenomenon is being uniquely a female thing, where we yeah. feel like we need to research and validate and support all of our arguments, but really yeah. we just have to give our opinion because our opinion is only going to be one sliver of the entire conversation. It's not our prerogative or our mandate to have to describe everything <laughs> to explain every facet of capitalism in a book or every facet of marketing or whatever it is so i think that's really interesting that you've had the same experience okay there was something you said earlier and that was tandem to you scott and your question about clients and what they come for i just wanted to mention the other factor because i think they're two sides of the same coin the other thing clients come in for are it's because so, so when, when we feel that inner critic, we respond in two ways. We have either a defense of, uh, you know, first we start to say to ourselves, how, you know, gosh, I'm not doing enough. I should read more books, so on guilty, and so forth. Guilty, guilty. Doubt or guilty, right. But the other response that sometimes happens is, and, and you will see this in a lot of male-dominated fields, you will see an overcompensation of confidence. And that comes across like somebody who is a, in the, in the world of finance, I won't finish the sentence, but anybody who knows finance knows the end of the sentence. The big swinging blank. you <laughs> 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 poker. And so what happens is you act with a lot of bravado and a lot of kind of like, you know, obnoxiousness to really make up for the lack of genuine confidence you have in yourself. So we get those both showing up to mm -hmm. coaching because what happens, they basically realize, wow, this level of communication, this way of being in the world doesn't work. It probably served them at one point in their life, but it's not serving them now. So, but if you can see that both of those are the same side of the coin, because what's driving it is really this fundamental lack of 
confidence in themselves. And, you know, it's hard to look at people who have big egos and say, oh, my gosh, what do you mean their lack of confidence? Unless they're a narcissist, and, of course, those exist, but narcissists don't come to coaching because if you're a narcissist, you never think you're the one who needs to change, so you're not going to go to coaching. Yep. But ultimately, it's really just about the self-doubt. And we, most of us didn't grow up in a family uh, that was really emotionally as healthy as maybe it could have been. And we certainly didn't discover tools along the way in our society or in our academia that encouraged a good sense, healthy sense of self. So I think those are two of the things that come in. But also people just want consulting. You know, I think it's hard in this world to find somebody who is listening genuinely without an agenda. And, and to have somebody who's neutral and holds your agenda as the, the goal uh, without worrying about you and, and being able to push you beyond your comfort zone, I think that's very powerful too. Yep, love that. So we're nearing the end here. I'd love to finish up with some maybe tools or uh, paradigms or, or something that we can leave people with to help them overcome this and to do those big audacious and authentic moves in their own careers or their own lives? Well, I would, you know, in my book, I speak about five practices. And those five practices are the practices I would, would like to just give to your audience because I think they're fundamental. The first uh, uh, practice is self-responsibility. I'll just quickly talk about that. What that means is owning what shows up in your life, not blaming yourself for it, but just saying, wow, this is what my life looks like. This is what my business looks like, my relationships. What would it be like if I really began to take ownership of that and then if I wanted to change, I begin to say, okay, how can I be in relationship to all of these? Um, that, that one to me is really quite profound and that has to do a lot with you know looking at your life from possibility as opposed to from a place of limitation or victim, you know, being a victim, if you will. Um, the second practice that I'm a big fan of is really... Uh, being able to have empathy for yourself and for other people that realizing you know you're in a great battle as is everyone else and and the more empathy you're able to have for yourself the more you're able to kind of take yourself off the meat hook I say uh, around your life and your choices and mistakes you've made the more you can really extend that out to other human beings uh, practice three is uh, something called emotional connection. And that means learning how to serve hard to be with emotions. Uh, Raphael Kushner is a gentleman who created an amazing technique that, that I use with my clients that I love and I use for myself personally that helps you weather through a lot of volatility because you're going to feel that as an entrepreneur or anybody living in this world today. Nothing is, you know, certain. Um, and practice for is uh, being able to really see your life as a journey. You know, that he, we all are on a hero's journey, I believe, like Campbell spoke about. And we have an inner journey and an external journey. And to embrace that journey and, and go full throttle into whatever that is. It doesn't mean you have to be a business person or an entrepreneur. It could be that you're going to be the one nice guy on your floor in your company. You know, whatever that means for you or for that firm, that's still a journey and a, and a big thing to take on. Um, and the fifth one is mindfulness and meditation. You know, spend time in stillness. We don't spend enough time in stillness. And having just lived in Hawaii for the past year and a half, I can tell you that island succeeded at giving stillness in a way I couldn't find it in New York City. Uh, you know? you, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not the hugest fan of New York City, uh, but I'm the biggest fan of Hawaii. And after just coming back from there, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a long time, but 20, 30 minutes just outside, uh, you know, it doesn't matter where it's to, but just the sounds and the sun and just, you know, even if it's freezing there like it is today, Kay, at 70 Fahrenheit, <laughs> please don't complain. I mean, if it's like 40, please go ahead, complain, but, you know. Us <laughs> over here on the East Coast, we really I have no I saw people wearing scarves and jackets today outside. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, you, know what you know what happens when it's 70... Well, I guess that's about about 15 Celsius. You know what happens in Canada or in Newfoundland? People are going around with their sunroofs down, okay? <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. Shorts on, the whole nine yards. Um, so back to, you know, back, back, you know, I'm just a peanut gallery here. Um, 
so back to these five. So I just want to quickly before we we leave off here. So in the book, what's what what what's the goal of the book? And if someone was to buy this book, what is the outcome that you are looking that for that person to have? Uh, the goal of the book is to transform Wall Street, one capitalist at a time. Um, I want the the book to do one thing and one thing only. I want every person who reads that book to realize they are much more powerful than they realize. People think Wall Street is out there downtown, you know. No, we all are Wall Street. If we have a wallet, if we have money in a bank, if we have a 401k, if we have a credit card, we are Wall Street. We get to make decisions. If we invest our money in any small capacity, we are Wall Street. And I want people, especially those who are in business to realize that they can approach their business as a conscious capitalist. I am all true blue capitalist, but I am a conscious capitalist. I want to make a profit and make the world a better place. I don't think they're incongruent at all. And I think we've had for too long, we've been taught something that's been completely untrue, that the essence of capitalism is a sense of just taking care of yourself. That is not what Adam Smith had in mind. That's why he, when he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a book that's infrequently not read by capitalists, uh, he advocates that responsibility we have to our brother, to our community, and to our world. I, lo- I, I I'm love so it. I'm so excited to read it. I, yeah, I mean, I, I got to tell you, you know, I'm I'm the furthest thing from somebody that knows a whole lot in investing uh, by any stretch of imagination, uh, outside of like investing in like actual, you know. You know, small startups and that type of thing, but you make that book sound kick ass. So you know, I, 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 if it's anything to do with, I'm cool with you having self doubt about the whole fact of people reviewing it and everything else. But when it comes to actually doing well financially and in terms of book sales, I think you got a bestseller there. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for March to happen. Thank you, thank you so much, Scott. And cool. people can find you at thewallstreetcoach.com. Have you started that Twitter handle yet, Kim? Uh, what I have is a Kim Ann Curtin. I'm at Twitter at Kim Ann Curtin, but I, I, I know I need to have that eventually. I mean, the book, we have the website, transformingwallstreet.com. It's not launched yet, but it will be up soon. So we'll yeah. have that. And, and when this is posted, of course, uh, we'll also have all that information in the show notes over at The Limit. No. The Gee whiz, I can never podcast. read that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the almost had it. Almost, <laughs> almost. Yeah, so, so you, you can go over there and get all the show notes, all the information, uh, so you don't have to be sh- searching around the web uh, too much. Um, anything else that you want to add, Kim? Um. I think that I just, I want people to realize that capitalism can be a force for good and that it just starts with us. It starts with us. I love it. Listen, I love your passion. I absolutely uh, love the message behind this. Um, And uh, like I said, I know that it's definitely going to be, I I didn't really know where this conversation would go from the start. Uh, I can't say we have too many people, uh, I'll say that that's come from the Wall Street side of things on the show. Uh, But in saying that, I know that I've learned a lot and I know that everybody is listening certainly has learned a lot. lot, So thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. A pleasure to meet you, Kay. And thank you, Scott, to meet you face to face. Pleasure.